Hi, welcome to Herd Nerds. I have a real treat for those of you t- listening today, and even greater treat for those of you that are able to see us uh, on YouTube or on video. I have with me John Scarver from Midland Meats. He's fr- out of Midland, Texas, and I am so excited to have a generational rancher on board. Hi, John. I just want to welcome you to the podcast. Hey, Desi. Thank you. And I appreciate you having me on here. Yeah. And I want to kind of explain to people, I'm going to show a video uh, because John has a great video about everything that um, he's done. But we're going to talk a little bit first about, you know, where he's come from. And uh, I want to try to explain what you're going to see today on this podcast. But when I say generational, John goes back five generations and he started actually from his family started in the lamb business. Is that right, John? In, yes, in ma'am. Sheep? Yeah, I mean, you, you go back um, really in 1883 when my family migrated to Texas and um, from up upstate New York and um, got to Fort Worth and kind of followed the railroad tracks. And uh, started ranching here in Texas, you know, shortly after that, 1884, 1885, right in there. But uh, it all started with sheep. And that that's how kind of our story started. My great, great uncle was waiting tables in a, in a restaurant at a hotel in Abilene, Texas, and had heard some sheep farmers talking about uh, the market not being very good. And he was trying to get in the business any way he could. And that's, that's kind of how that started. He, he, he said, Hey, I'd, I'd like to take your sheep off your hands. And, you know, 139, 40 years later, here we are still running cattle and around this part of Texas. Right. And you started out with Herefords. And so um, tell me a little bit about your dad and, and uh, his ranching background. Yeah, you bet. No, um, you know, every one of my, um, you know, like four or five that came before me, it started with a pair of uncles. My, I'd call them my great great uncles, and then uh, my great granddad, Clarence Scarber. Uh, he kind of took over the the cattle company um, early 1900s, 1917, I believe. He became uh, manager there, and uh, shortly after that, well, 1925, my granddad, Clarence Scarber Jr., was born, and and he. Uh, he he had to take over things at a really young age. My great grandfather had put some ranches together at the time. We had moved further further west, so out, take Abilene and go west. Kind of settled in a little town called Marinfield, which is now Stanton, Texas. It's probably fifteen twenty miles east of Midland, Texas. That's where we're kind of headquartered and have operated now for a long time. But um, that's kind of where he set up shop there and started running those sheep, like I talked about. And these, uh, all the cowmen in this part of the world said, you know, there's wolves and coyotes out here. You can't, you're going to have a hard time running those sheep. So kind of traded out those sheep, sold them, uh, loaded them on a train and sent them north and um, came in, brought some of the very first uh, Hereford cattle. So introduced Hereford cattle into this part of the state and uh, brought them to Texas and Southeast New Mexico. We had some ranches there. So uh, my family at that time had put together a little over half a million acres is what we were running. Um, 10, 11 ranches right in there. So uh, stocked them with Hereford cows. So at one point had one of the largest Hereford, registered Hereford herds in the country. Um, You know, they were quality. It was always a kind of a thing my family stuck with. So they wanted good cattle and um, it was running, you know, 20 to 30,000 head of uh, mother cows and, uh, that's kind of where it started. So, uh, granddad took over and, you know, 1942, when my great granddad passed away, my, my grandfather was 17 when he got that call. So he, he came home from school. Um, he had a, he had a, uh, obviously a cattle operation and we had some other business here in Midland that he had to attend to. And, um, he ran it right up till World War II. And, um, he decided, uh, and they told him, they said, Mr. Scarborough, you got some, you know, you got enough to do back home, kind of give him a, a way out of the war. But he said, no, I'm going to go. So he enlisted in the Navy and, uh, and he, he, he spent some time in the ocean. Um, you know, I heard some of his stories and 
obviously. So he's, he's a veteran. And when he got back, he went, he went back to work running the ranches while he was gone. His mom, Ruth Cowden Scarver ran the ranches while he was gone. And, um, then my dad, my dad came along, Chris, and, uh, he, he took over kind of the ranch operations in the, the early seventies. And, um, he was, he, he was, he took on that, that role of quality. And that's something I think you'll see and hear us talk about a lot in this podcast is quality. Cause I think that's something that we really stress and, and want to talk about, but he, his main goal was to get uh, our beef, commercial beef at this time, we're a commercial cow calf operation um, to white, to what he called a white tablecloth. Right. That, you know, like a high end steakhouse or a better steakhouse. And, and, and that's, that's how, how I know you so well is because uh, just to let all of you listeners know, John has always sent his beef in for testing and it has come out on top every time and every year that I've known. And, and uh, he raises a, a F1 a percentage mostly, right, John? Mostly that, percentage that's right. cattle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You bet, yeah. And, sure. yeah. And, and that came later on. He started crossing uh, Wagyu with his Herefords to, uh, because he's all about quality. And uh, I just, I tell you, you're not going to find a, uh, uh, somebody that knows more about cattle, knows more about breeding cattle and has a really, he has exceptional quality and we're going to show that to you today. So, um, well, Desi, I don't know. That's awfully nice to say. I don't, I don't know. I haven't reinvented any wheels, but I just kind of fell in line with, you know, I like to tell people when they ask us about our beef, I just tell them that, you know, it's over a hundred years of decisions and, and, um, yeah, dad, when he introduced the Angus to our herd in the 80s and 90s and then uh, purchased our first Wagyu bull in 2010, somewhere right in there, um, and that kind of kicked it off. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, it really wasn't about the meat when I bought my first Wagyu bull. I was looking for a, a low birth weight bull that threw a black calf. And uh, at the time, we were breeding registered jerseys. And so it, it, I kind of lucked into the beef side and uh, realize, man, we really have something with that beef. And now here we are. And it's been, it's been a fun ride. I'll tell you that much. Well, and I want to tell you what impressed me the most uh, was when I saw your mama cows. Now, you know how to pick those mama cows out. I was just, they blew me away. They look so good, so well, healthy. And, and, you know, there's a lot of different um, takes on mama cows. Some people like them to be you know, you, you know, smaller in stature, you know, short leg, but, but you've got those tanks over there in Midland. I really like the mama cows that you have. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. That when you cross and get the heterosis and use that hybrid vigor, those breeds. And I know a lot of people, you know, an animal unit's kind of figured by a thousand pound cow with a calf buyer. And, um, you know, I run a 15 to 1800 pound cow and that's, that comes from, like I said, years of breeding. I don't really buy any outside females. So, but when I do go buy bulls, I buy registered and, and, you know, we're looking at the top. I rarely go outside the top 5% of a breed. So whether that's Angus, Hereford or the Wagyu's, I'm buying the top one or 2% of the EPDs of that breed. Plus I look at the bull. Mm-hmm. I, I rarely will ever buy any bull unseen because I want to see him. And if he doesn't fit what we're after, then he's not going to end up in our program. But I appreciate you saying it. Yeah, we, we, you know, there's a lot of ranchers that think you need a small cow because they take a little less to feed and whatnot. But I kind of look at the back end. I like a, I like weaning a 650 pound calf or 600 pound calf at six months. I like giving that cow another, you know, an extra month or two to recover to get that next calf. And, mm-hmm. and doing that, we kind of maintain a high 90s, 98% calf crop across the ranches. Well, I'll tell you, you also have a great story about a bull that I think will resonate with all of us that have ranches that uh, want to move animals or have bulls and they they just, you know, it, it just never works out like you want all the time. You but also, also, I want people to know when John says a bull's halfway across the pasture, he's talking about 
four thousand acres away. Is that right, John? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and I've I've got we we've got a ranch here just north of Midland, and unfortunately, uh, last May I shipped every cow off that place um, just because we we've, we've been in a two to three year drought down here. But uh, yes, ma'am, that's a you know that's a twenty eight section ranch. The the pastures tend to get a little bigger. Um, I've got a ranch up in the panhandle. We, we avoided all those grass fires, uh, praise the Lord, but there was, you know, that's pretty detrimental. That's bad deal for a lot of folks up there. We were further West of that, the big range fires. I'm sure you saw on the, uh, on yes, the news. I was but, concerned. Um, I've got a ranch up there that can handle my cattle and then a farm up, up in the Groover Spearman area. Okay, well, I'd love to show that video uh, start yeah, now. Let's, let's, let's see how it looks and uh, let everybody listen to it. You know, I was, I was picking up bulls one day and I, I liked one bull and I spent a day trying to get him to get hot. He'd fight me, brush up and, you know, he didn't want to go anywhere. Try him the next day, same thing. I'd go out there early and work on him. One day I had him going and he had him about halfway across the pasture and, and he decided he didn't want to go anymore. And it was hot and it got hot and he got hot. And so, you know, I got hot and kind of we both quit right there and said, maybe there's another day for you. You know, I kind of had to come to Jesus moment and, and it was frustrating because I needed to get that bull in. I needed to get him loaded and get him to another ranch and uh, went about my day and, and just kind of avoided, you know, thinking about the bull. I, I went to prayer a little bit and, and uh, when I pulled back up to the house that evening, I noticed that there was something standing in my pen. That bull that I've been fighting for two or three days was just standing there inside the pen. I just walked around and shut the gate. If you don't think God has humor, you know, that's that's one of those times when, when you think you're in control of a situation, uh, you realize real quick that we don't control timing and what's going on. So what I've learned, God's timing is the most important timing. That's great, John. I think we've all experienced that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> really, really, Desi, that story, you know, it, it, it hit home because, you know, ranchers got to be patient. That's one thing. Um, you're always waiting on the rain, next rain or, or whatnot. And that story kind of speak, spoke to me kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, when I talk about God's timing, I talk about, um, you know, the way, the way it's supposed to be, the way God intended it to be. And, I look at, you know, the hundred plus years of history that our family has in the cattle business. And, you know, today is, 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 is my time in that. But if I, if I was trying to push something too hard, you know, it, it wasn't going to happen unless it was, is, unless it was in God's will and, and my calling and what I was supposed to be doing. So I learned a lesson back then and I've, I've tried to keep to it, you know, as good as I can that, you know, you gotta, you gotta ask God what you're supposed to be doing and he'll, he'll show you the way. And that's, that's, you know, I, that's where all this credit for what Midland Meat Company's be done. And it's just, that's kind of that story. It's, it's, Hey, everything happens for a reason. I don't believe in coincidences. Um, but God showed me that day that, you know, I could have gone and got a trailer, probably roped that bull and drug him in a trailer or something. And, risk getting hurt, risk hurting a bull, hurting my horse, hurting myself, you know, tearing something up. But um, it was real easy to walk around and close that gate. And God just showed me sometimes he can make the, the really hard, impossible things easy if you just, if you just put your faith in him and, and let him handle it. I agree. I agree. So, John, yeah. this video also shows um, – you um, herding cattle, which I think it's important for people to see because, you know, people uh, love to watch Yellowstone, and but you're the real thing. So I, I'd love to, to uh, play this video and let people see what, what it's really like out there. Yeah, and, and 
I, I want you to, and I want, I want the people at home to understand what this video is. Uh, we made this video um, to basically explain to our consumer who walks in our meat store what we do, because there's a lot of meat out there. And most people just think meat comes from a grocery store. And um, we like to tell the story behind our beef. We want people to know where their food comes from. And this is, this is a way of us kind of explaining, hey, this is how this meat gets here. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to love to uh, kind of hit on that as we kind of get through the video and on the back end of the, the podcast. But um, this, this is pretty good, you know, within a short version of what we do. Well, Justin, let, let's roll this video and see how it goes. Scarborough Cattle Company is made up of five generations. They actually started with Herefords in the 1890s, registered her. Coming from sheep, going to Hereford, sold all the sheep then and, and started running Hereford and building the herds. Most everybody from, from the Panhandle to West Texas ran Hereford cattle back then. We started our genetics with those Herefords. And we actually went through three generations with her. When I came along, fourth generation, in the uh, 1980s, I crossed them on a, with an Angus bull, which gave us a black baldy, an F1 cross. This F1 cross is what started John off in his meat market of breeding Wagyu bulls to these crossbred black baldies. I just wanted to pause it here for a minute, John, and explain a little bit to people. So when what pe most people don't understand because they have not herded cattle before is that uh, those people that are riding drag in the back uh, on a dusty day, that that isn't something you ever see on TV where they're <laughs> getting the dust all over their face. And that's why uh, cowboys wear bandanas so they can protect themselves from all the dust. And then I see you've got some really uh, great guys, some uh, outriders on each on the side, and that's keeping the cattle together. And uh, this is how they put them in a pen. And another thing I want y'all to notice is that they're not going uh, yelling and waving their hats in the air and, and nobody's running uh, because you do not want to run cattle on a hot day uh, <laughs> and stir things up. But you go easy, you go calm, and that's the only way you're going to get them in a pen. Isn't that right, John? Well, that, you know, that's right. And we tried to, and these cattle, we had just come through a gate. And um, so we had just kind of held them and we had to get them started. We, we we're driving them in this picture. We're driving them south. And there's a fence on their uh, left side. You can probably see that. That'd be the east side. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we're, we're driving them and they're, I got a set of pins they're going to go into up there. But yeah, we just got them, got them in the pen. There's, I'm not sure how many cows are in that bunch right there, but um yeah great great hands we we've always been blessed with i mean the, the cowboys and cowgirls have come out and helped us or you know some of the best and we can't do it without those guys and they're on good horses that's something we've done since day one we we still gather everything horseback um we still drag to the fire brand calves uh, you'll see in this video um we can brand 200 calves and and uh, you know under three hours um because we got we got the men and women that can do it. We'll run two sets of draggers and you'll see that. But yeah, this is a set of Hereford cows uh, up there in Amarillo, uh, just West Amarillo on my ranch, the Alamacitas Ranch. And you bet you can see 
kind of how we got to kind of keep them against the fence there, but not too much. You give them a little air. You know, if you know anything about cows and the way they can see, um, they can't see directly behind them, but they, they, if you're at an angle, you can, you can really work them. You can work them at a 45 behind them too. So we don't want to crowd them. We'd like them to, you know, move, but not run out. And I don't, I really don't like people hollering. Uh, sometimes you got to, when you're in a pen just to get something to turn or go, but our cattle, I think you really hurt grades. If you wild cattle equal, you know, bad grades. I, I like gentle mm -hmm. cattle that, that usually makes your beef better. Oh, yes. And that's been proven scientifically as well, that the more stressed an animal is, the uh, worse it grades. So we'll just roll this video and uh, it's, yeah, I'll just uh, let it take its course. It's a great video. You would get already, you can see we had already pinned some, um, our ball, my baldy calves are over there on the, on the outside. We were about mm -hmm. to ship them down somewhere. Yep. And now we're going to go get into the branding segment. And you said you can do about 200 in a couple, few hours. That's around three hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, we like to be done by, you know, cause we don't want things hot you mentioned it and, uh, yeah. It can get hot. You, you can see some of these guys wearing vests and, um, you know, wild rags because of a morning, mm -hmm. it's it's chilly up there. It's probably 30, 35 that morning. And by the time we're getting to the pens, it's probably around 50 degrees, but it can heat up in the afternoon. So we try to be done by noon or one o'clock where those calves and anything we work don't get too hot. It's just, like you said, limit the stress on them. And right. heat, heat and stress really pay a toll on cattle. I agree. 2015 we decided to pretty much turn into a fully integrated ranch where we're utilizing all of our genetics our cows out here are, are being used to produce a product we're selling now beef uh, box beef direct to consumers so in a way we've got our own branded beef program through midland meat company and scarborough ranch beef it all starts right here on the ranches and it all ends in a meat case in midland texas and all the steps that go in between it, you know, there's a lot there, but we've got our hands on every aspect of the business. In 2023, we're going to celebrate 140 years. That's, that's my dad there next to me. He's a foot. spraying for lice and stuff like that. Okay, Desi, what you saw there is, you know, they whatever you want to call it, a traditional branding. That's just kind of the only way we know how to do it. But when we when we catch those calves and, and bring them up to those flankers and get them down, um, especially on those uh, Herefords, we'll, we'll dehorn all the, the Hereford steers or bull calves. Obviously, we're going to castrate them right there. So, they become steers and we brand them. And then I give them um, basically their, their vaccinations as a calf. And that's something that we stress. We, you know, we're an all natural program. So I'm, I'm within a, you know, a, a program that fits us in there and we'll pour them and give them some vitamin and that's it. They get, they get, uh, uh, let's see, two shots, uh, three shots at branding with a pour on and we'll dehorn those. Um, like I said, the steers, all the Wagyu's get dehorned. Uh, my Hereford, my Hereford heifers, I'll keep the horns on them, and I'll and I'll dehorn any uh, black baldies or or black cows I have. But that's that's what we did there, and, and spraying those cows, we'll we'll spray those. That's just for for uh, lice and and different things they might get. Um, kind of keep the flies off of them too for a little bit. Mm -hmm.
Now this would be a more of a weaning situation here in the video. This is this is after the calves have grown. Probably this is probably the first part of August, um, and I'm weaning I'm weaning the calves off the cow. And this is the first the next the, the second time we'll touch that calf in its life, and um, we'll process them. Same thing. I run them through. I will revac them then and get them ready to wean. And then you'll also see where I'm going to put a an EID tag, an individual um, uh, ID in the animal that is, we, we go through IMI Global, it's a third party auditor. And um, that way our labels and the, what our claims are backed up by auditors and a third party that then turns it into the USDA and they, they um, honor our, our breed. You know, I can do Wagyu, I can do Angus, I can do Hereford. And then plus it, it makes sure that people at the at the packing plants, when we when we send them into our processors, the USDA inspector can can look up a birth date and it has a range and it makes sure that these cattle are under the 30 month. The 30 month rule is what we call it, but they're under 30 months of age before I harvest them. Yeah. And for people that don't understand the EID what this does is at any time, if you have a wand reader, we we have a wand that'll read that tag. It's it's electronic. And so if you have a calf and you put the wand on the calf, it tells you exactly who that calf is. You know where it came from. You know exactly how old it is. And um, it just has valuable information uh, that you can track from, you know, from birth to harvest. It's a really great way to keep up with an animal. Look at it, it's got a number on it. That number will stay with that animal all the way through. And then the, they'll wand it at these yards and anywhere else. They'll show up in their computer. But that way, when I harvest them, I can make sure they're under 30 months of age. And uh, we can guarantee the breed. So when I'm marketing the beef, we can market it appropriately. We can put Wagyu on the Wagyu, Hereford on the Hereford, and Angus on the Angus. It's a little more work to do it this way, but we keep our cattle all natural. This will update everything that we do to them. That way, if anybody has a question on our beef, they can trace, they can trace it back right to the animal. You can tell we shot this a couple different times because of the grass and it's green at one point and not in the other. I got baby calves in there, you know, so we were putting a video together, but uh, we're coming out. You can tell um, that the change in the country you saw, this was obviously before the green. Um, and you can just see kind of the drought that, you know, Texas has been in. Now we were blessed last year to catch some rain and that's where you're seeing uh, we greened up, grew some grass, and um, and I stock pretty conservative, so it's, you know, we're continuous grazing where I keep cattle in a pasture year around. Uh, the rotation is if, if needed, but I, I kind of run, you know, half of what I could run kind of a deal, and mm -hmm. that way we can run cattle year round. Yeah, rotational grazing is is a, a great way to go. It, but uh, I really know that you've been hit hard with weather, you know, phenomenon. And, uh, and I was so worried about you this year with the fires. I'm so glad that, you know, you didn't suffer anything from that. And, and my, yeah. heart, my heart goes out to all the other ranchers that were caught in the crossfire. Yeah, it's a bad deal. And, 
you know, there's a lot of people that lost a lot and lost everything and fires, fires a bad deal. We had a big fire on that country, that, that ranch right there that burned probably, you know, 6,000 acres last year. And, um, just fortunate enough though, in May, we, May and June, we caught a little over 15, between 15 and 17 inches of rain on that ranch, which sadly, a lot of y'all might say, well, that's, that's not a lot of rain, but that's a yearly average, uh, for our regions here in Texas, uh, mm -hmm. here in Midland, it's 15 a year. And up there in the panhandle, it's a little over 17 inches a year. So getting 17 inches right in the middle of your growing season is about as good as it can get. The Lord bless that, that fire. And, uh, hopefully he can do the same with all that country up there in the panhandle right now. I hope so. Look at the big old Angus boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to see a transition to the meat store. Midland's a special place. Um, in the 139, 140 years of the existence of the city, you know, we believe the people behind this city are what make it, and the, and the quality that they stand for is something that Midland Meat Company wants to be right up there with the with the standard of Midland and we want to serve nothing but the best because we feel that that's what Midland is. Every time you walk through those doors you can expect the highest quality here at Midland Meat Company. say it a lot in here that's more than just meat because uh, uh, I know the story behind every cut I know uh, the work that goes behind all the all the beef that we sell here all the people that are that are involved you know from the ranches to the people here at the meat store and then obviously over at the, the half acre uh, middle meat company now employs close to 40 families and that wouldn't be possible without you know us opening our meat market and that's that's to me, that's a testament not only of our community and the, the support that we've had, but just the, the help and the, uh, the good folks that are here, um, whether it's on the ranches or here at Midland Meat Company or over at the Half Acre. Quality is uh, something you're looking for and quality is what you expect. Quality is something you can get at Midland Meat Company. And, that's quality a, means a lot to us here. We say eat quality meats, and we mean that. We don't just mean with our beef. Uh, we mean with all of our proteins. So if you've, if you've never been to Midland Meat Company, we'd love to have you. Come in, see what we're about, and, and we'll treat you right. Not just with quality product, but with quality service. story it's just a, it's just a story on a ranch and a lot of ranchers see those things and 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 a lot of people don't get to experience that life but uh, you know I think that story is something that I'm going to pass down probably to my kids and to their kids because it, it showed it showed everything right there and it showed that we're not in control and um, we got to do the best with what we've got and make the best of every day and you know taking that mindset I think that's what, you know, makes Midland Meat Company special and the people behind it. That's really great, John. And I, I tell you, I saw not only do you have all the awards from Triple Crown for raising great beef, but you also cook pretty good, too. I mean, you've won everything, haven't you? And well, brisket. you know, I, I, I haven't. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm very fortunate, very blessed to have. We have great cooks. Um, you know, I, I, we help sponsor multiple barbecue cooks in the competition world. And yeah, you saw a couple of the, 
you know, biggest trophies you can win right there as far as uh, brisket's concerned. And, you know, that's kind of brisket's king in Texas. And we I won think it's king there. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And those, those Midland Meat Company briskets, I think, I think they've become known, you know, I think the guys on the circuit know them and there's a lot of great beef out there, but what we try to do is great, get great people cooking it. And we're, that's mm-hmm. where we're extremely blessed. You know, I could tell you story after story, but yeah, we're, we'll be nine years October and, and I bet we've won a couple thousand first place briskets. I mean, we're getting up there, but the big ones you saw Houston, um, that's a world championship and we, we've won it twice, uh, with brisket American Royal, uh, three times and well, that's in Kansas city. Do you so, sell your cooked brisket in the store? We do. We, we offer it for sure. And, um, you know, that's just it. These, uh, it's, it's got a unique flavor and, you know, we can speak on that with our, our beef being half Wagyu quarter Hereford quarter Angus, you know, it's not, it's not so rich that you can't eat it in that much than that much. Like you uh-huh. can actually, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't fill you up right away. Now it, it's rich. You can tell there's Wagyu in it, but there's enough Angus and Hereford in there to where you, you still feel like you're not, you know, it's, you, you can get the real, the old traditional meat flavor in there too so it's a good mixture and i think i think that's what what really helps it it's all american that's what it that, is yeah it's, yeah it's all texan really these yeah. cattle you know they're they're texas native and it's american beef you know that's that's something i stress you know we're, we're kind of losing losing sight of that and people knowing what they're eating and you know we we want to know you can you can holler at us and you know what you're getting and um the beef that we sell we can we can back it up do you ship to people like if someone is, sees this podcast and they want to get your some of I'm gonna order some of that brisket. <laughs> well, I'll get you some brisket. <laughs> it's it's really good and we and we do. Um we've shipped all over and you know, being able to like we do, I process in two different plants and that's just it to go back and talk about these things because it's fun it's fun to talk about now, but like going back to day one when I, when I first turned that Wagyu bull out to where we are now and the people from, you know, Joe Morris at Morris Stock Farm, uh, making that phone call and asking him, Hey, I heard you feed Wagyu cattle to, I rely on him just like I do any, anybody that works with us. You know, we, we all work together like, and then Brown's meat market, you've got a generational farm there with three generations of Morris family. And you've got a generational Packer and um, Stratford, uh, the Brown, the Chavoya family, the Brown, the Brown's meat locker. Um, you know, well, now I, I know Joe Morris and he's fed out cattle that have won, uh, you know, big carcass competitions, you know, like statewide carcass competitions, oh, not yeah. just, They're, not just first place, but first and second, and, uh, third place with some, you know, oh, they, they do such, so a, he's, they do he's such really, a great job. Yeah, they really yeah. do. Mm-hmm. They they feed some of the, you know, the more the bigger names in the in the business. Um, well, A Bar N no longer there, but uh, um, the Rosewood outfit. You know, our cattle obviously are there, and uh, you know, Four B. I think it was last year that Four B came in first in the yeah F one, and, and we came in second. And and I want to say that that maybe four of the top five fed carcasses that won that deal the triple crown last year came out of morris's feed uh grow yard right he's got a he's got a special touch i think um you know it's like i said it's a family operation he's got his whole family there brandy Brittany, dustin they've got 4b beef and they're raising some of the best beef in the country i've seen it and i'm even like Mm -hmm. man that's good stuff and when they when they beat our steak i said man i just gotta take my hat off like (laughs) that's good stuff so I mean, you know, I, I I love the fact that people are raising good quality beef and cattle, and and I it, and it I think the people eating it appreciate it too. Right, and you know, I'm going to say this, but because I do a lot of testing on beef, and I do testing on beef from all over, uh, I do testing on you know imported beef too that comes here, and um, I can tell you that American USA beef. Uh, be it Angus, Wagyu, Hereford, USA beef just really outperforms uh, anything I've seen, uh, well, you know. You know, it ought to. Um, 
I think we're held to a little higher standard here just with the regulations that, that we've got to deal with. Um, you know, and there's some labeling conflicts and interest, you know, if you're a real, if you're a real rancher, you need to know about, you know, um, what American beef really is right now. It's just kind of defined as anything harvested in the United States. Well, that's not really the case. A lot of that beef is coming from other countries. You've got mm -hmm. some of the major packers in this country are foreignly owned. You know, they're getting beef elsewhere. They're getting cattle elsewhere, bringing them in, feeding them and, and harvesting them here. And that's, it's not the same. And I think there's a lot of domestic ranchers that get, you know, especially on the cow calf end, because that's, that's the end I operate on. And um, I still consider myself a commercial cow calf guy even though we're nearly fully integrated now, but that's kind of our roots. And it seems like the bottom, which, you know, I hate to call the cow calf guy the bottom because that's where I am, but they pay the price for everything that happens above them and has to, and they really take the toll. And that's why I think you're seeing, you know, with a little drought, but you're seeing a 60 year low on inventory on cattle. That's why you got the live prices as high as they are, mm -hmm. but um, we're at a 60 year low on cattle numbers when it comes to replacements and, and, and cow herds, we're, we're losing our ranchers. And I, th I think the feed supply, the cost of feed during COVID too, uh, really caused a lot of hardship. I know it did on me because you oh, know, gosh. I, I don't well, grow my own feed and I, I, I would, I just, for feed prices to double almost, I was just taken aback, you know, uh, to make no, it you're, through that. You're, Desi, you're exactly right. Like, um, you know, I don't want to get in politics here, but shortly after the election, everything doubled. Um, yep. Corn, corn mainly. Corn's a big driver in our industry. Oh, yeah, corn. And, <laughs> I could <laughs> hardly feed the deer this year, you no. know. <laughs> but, you know, when you, when you go messing with corn, it's a globally traded commodity, and it's in just about anything. And, and when you go messing around with that commodity – it's affecting proteins and yeah, when it costs twice as much to feed an animal, like it, like it has in the last mm -hmm. two or three years and you, and, and the consumers wondering why the prices at the grocery store have gone up so much. Well, listen, if, 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 if people didn't raise their prices, there would be nothing to eat because right? Right. You, you're not sustainable at when, when you, when everything doubles on the, on the, on our end, but you can only raise your prices just a little bit because you know, you want people still getting your stuff, but you don't want, you can't, you can't lose money or else, you know, we're going to be selling ranches. So it's, you know, uh, you're, it's, you're, a tough, it's a tough deal. Here's what happened too. So when the feed prices went sky high, I'm talking to my friends that have feedlots. They're like, Desi, we've never seen so many heifers coming through these feedlots. And I said, well, if everybody's throwing their heifers in to the, you know, group what's going to happen when you got to have replacement you know in the years coming i mean the amount of heifers going in feedlots was uh phenomenal amounts compared to previous years yes well a lot a lot of that is i i think and this is just my opinion but um and you can take it for what it's worth i'm not going to claim to know anything or any more than anybody <laughs> but you know in a, in a drought situation situation you know, a lot of people, they have different ways of doing it. Like in my situation, if I'm droughted out, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid or feed my heifers. Um, you're going to keep a proven, a proven entity, which is your cow, your cow. Like if a cow's on my ranch and she makes it to her nine years to, to her 10th year, that means she's had nine calves with me. Um, because if she's dry, she's cut out of the herd, even as early as a heifer. So, um, and that's how we've sustained good calf crops. But in a drought situation, you got to do what's best for the ranch and take a proven entity that's going to have you a calf. So you see a lot of younger cattle in her, in her grow yards in a time of drought, in a time where it might be too expensive to keep your cows. And, and that's kind of what I think you saw. And so a big number I like to look at at cattle markets is, is the replacements and where that number is. That's going to tell you a lot about the, the markets. And I think I think, you know, the next year or two ought to be pretty good for the for the cow man. If he can stay in, you're seeing these really good prices, really high prices for live cattle and fat cattle. So, you know, we don't get paid very often on the bottom, the cow calf guy, you know, and you're lucky to make money two out of 10 years. And and um, that's one of the reasons why I, I went the way we did. 
and created our own market Mm because I didn't like the ups and downs and the having good cattle, but not getting paid for them. And so, you know, I I encourage ranchers all over the, the country to, to try to try to figure out a way to get your beef to local markets and, and control your beef because that's the way of the future. I think people are really going to want to know what they eat and where it comes from. And the only way to do it is to keep your genetics, keep your cattle and, and see them all the way through. I agree with you. And, and I do know that uh, I do know a lot of people moving towards that. I mean, I know a lot of people that, you know, that have quality beef. And so I want to encourage consumers to, you know, you don't know what you're buying when you're at a, you know, a big uh, store that just sells meat. But if you buy from local ranchers and farmers, you know exactly what you're getting. And I guarantee you, you're getting a better product because these people really care about the quality of their product. And, you know, if anybody, wherever you live, wherever you are, if you need to know a local rancher or farmer that you can buy from, please uh, contact Herdners or contact me because I'll, I'll put you close. There's somebody close to you. I guarantee you that you can purchase quality beef from. Yeah. And I'm and, sure there's yeah. ranchers that are willing to get together with other ranchers and, yeah. you know, co-op. I, you co-op. know, I think that might, that's probably the way of the future of this deal. Um mm-hmm. You know, because the average cow herd in the United States, I, I can't, I, last I looked when I was in TC ranch management, so I'm going back 20 years, but the average cow herd is like 10 head. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and that's, that's like, you know, there's a lot more people running five to 25 cows than there are running a thousand to 2,500 cows. So, um, you know, there's going to have to be some co-ops. There's going to have to be some ranchers get together. Well, um, come up with a label and, and work together and get their beef out there. Cause there's never a better time than right now to do it. And, you know, let's, and that's just kind of it. If we want to, if we want to hold our domestic market and our American beef and keep that, um, I'll just keep that standard of, of, of quality with when USA is on that beef, then that we need to, we need to protect that. That's right. And I heard that USDA did come out with a label uh, to put on beef that uh, is born and raised here in the United States, that it is USA beef. And, and I hope that people are very uh, conscientious about purchasing USA beef, beef born and raised here in the United States. Because honestly, uh, I see beef all the time. I grade beef. I work with beef. I research, uh, work with, you know, looking at every aspect of that, of meat, uh, in the industry. And I can tell you that the United States, we have the best grains. We have the most conscientious ranchers. And I really, really am so excited uh, to show the quality of USA beef. That's the whole, the whole point of the triple crown is to, uh, let people know that ra- there are ranchers out there that are doing exceptional jobs like John does raising his beef, taking care of his beef from, you heard him from the mamas, you know, up to the genetics, there's a lot to it. And all of these, uh, ranchers are doing this and we need to support USA beef. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, there's a lot of terms, pasture to plate, farm to Mm -hmm. table, farm to table. I I, I go as far as conception to consumption. That's kind of what I like to say. I love that. Because I, you know, when you're selecting bulls to breed and and, I mean, you're there from the step, the very first step and the the problem, or uh, you can say it's a problem. It was for me the first few years because you turn a bull out, Desi, and then, you know, you, you, however long you want to run your bulls, I keep mine out 75 days, 90 at the most. But uh, we usually calve 80 percent of those come in the first oh, 30 days. So it's it's pretty tight. But at the end of the day, you're talking nine months before you have a calf after you turn a bull out. And then you got to raise that calf on that cow. And then you got to wean that calf off that cow. And then you got to fatten that calf up. And you got to grow that calf to get fat and ready to harvest. And so my harvest target is between, you know, anywhere from between 22 and 27 months of age. So you're looking at 
pretty much, I mean, you're, you're three years in at that point, because by the time you kick the bull out and then the calf's born 27 months later, you're, you're about three years. And so you don't know if it worked or didn't work. So you don't know till you pull your, you know, pull your hide off and, and see what you got. And that's right. kind of a, that's kind of the gamble of this deal. You kind of got to trust your genetics and I'll tell you what, it's humbling. Sometimes some of your cattle don't grade and you're like, okay. Cause just because a cow looks good out there doesn't mean that doesn't mean they're going to grade. And I think that's a misperception too of, of a lot of ranchers. They think they got really good cattle, but that you got to take the hide off and see what you got. Cause we're in the business of raising beef and you know, anything you need to be raising choice or better in my opinion. So get better genetics, uh, try your best, you know, what fits your program and, and use what works. And, but really it, it, it's nice to know. And that's, what's fun about the triple crown. You know, some of these numbers I have to, you know, and sorry, I'm not, I had to Google and look up what some of the things are. I mean, I'm not a scientist by any means. We don't like Desi one time asked me, she goes, well, do you know what bull bred that beef? And I go, Desi, I really don't. I'm sorry. Like I own, you know, 40 to 50 Wagyu bulls. <laughs> I turn them out. I let them be bulls. I pick I'm them so up. mad at you. You didn't well, know who the I'm, hell produced that steak. Well, and I wanted yeah, but I, I can tell you this. I've, I've been buying bulls. I, I go back to the very first one I bought from Jim, Jim Chisholm and Chisholm cattle down in Wimberley, Texas. And um, that's really the first time I even saw a Wagyu bull. And, um, we jumped him across trailer, I back trailer to trailer up with Jim on a, off of I 10 down on in Sonora, Texas. And I jumped that bull into my trailer and, and Jim said, man, I've never seen that done. I said, well, I don't see any pins around here and I don't want him on the interstate. So we're going to, we're going to load him and, and I'm going to get him back to Midland. And the funny thing is when I unloaded him, um, and I'm going back to the very first bull I bought um 007 i do know that his name and ichi ichi rose something or other and um but uh turn that bull out and he looked over at my heifers and he's about a foot and a half shorter than my heifers <laughs> and uh i joked and and my my rancher that was out there that i kind of my kind of one of my my men i learned under ken albus said oh they'll they'll get in a trail he'll get one so that was kind of how that happened. So they ended up breeding them all. That's one thing I found about the Wagyu breed. Very, very fertile. Um, <laughs> they will get after it. And, you know, it took a few years of breeding them to understand you don't have to run one to 15 or 20. You can, you can stretch them out and they'll, they'll cover your cows. Right. They're very prolific. They are. <laughs> and, I, and I got my first bull from Chisholm, too. And Did he you really? Out, oh, yeah. And he was a really great bull. Yeah, great, that's great good. bull. But, so, um, yeah, that's good. I, I still this day, I mean, Wagyu bulls are hard to come by, you know, uh, finding good ones. Um, that's kind of the deal. I'm the Angus and the, the Angus and the Hereford breeds have been established so long here in the United States. So the, the database and the data is there and the, the Wagyu deals just kind of just now catching up on the EPDs, you know, Australia kind of has a, kind of has the corner on the EPDs, but mm -hmm. the EPDs in this country are catching up and it's getting better. I think, uh, I think bull breeders and bull people raising bulls understand that the EPDs matter just because something's a bull doesn't need to, doesn't mean you need to keep it a bull. And right. I think if the integrity of the herd, the, 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 the breed of Wagyu, I think Wagyu breeders need to take that into you know, that way they can start getting the big, big money for these bulls and not just keeping bulls because they're bulls. And I think, I think that means a lot, you know. Right. Well, uh, I have a really good bull that phenotypically is, you know, off the charts. And so when I tried him on Angus to, because I wanted to get carcass data on him and I, uh, you know, I didn't, didn't make any calves for bulls, but now I have people wanting ca uh, bulls out of him, and I have already harvested them all for oh, data. So. Oh, the half, the half <laughs> yeah. bull? Yeah, yeah. I just I'd harvest them all to get the data, so I was d didn't think that one out too good. Well, I I think you I know think you stuff did. happens. <laughs> no, I think you did all right. I, you know, that's just trying to get a bigger a bigger calf and. And that's something, you know, if you raise the Wagyu's, you understand they're slow, they're slower maturing animals. And mm -hmm. I've had to change branding dates that we've had for 
generations because I, I'll wait two weeks, two weeks later than we normally would do it just because I need a little more horn growth. So we don't uh-huh. miss the horn. Right. And um, feeding them. And that's, that was a big decision. That was, that's what kind of makes our deal work is having the, the three breeds in there. And like I said, I, I mentioned the word hybrid vigor, or heterosis, whatever you want to use there, but by cross, by cross breeding those genetics, I'm able to get bigger beefs, bigger carcasses. Um, you know, when I'm looking at EPDs on the English side, on my Angus and my Herefords, I'm buying, I'm buying ribeye, I'm buying marbling. You know, I look at weaning and yearling weights. And when I'm, when I'm buying Wagyu bulls, I'm looking at, I'm looking obviously at marbling. I'm looking at uh, beef dollars. I'm looking at ribeyes. Um, Cause that's what we're in business of selling beef. And right. the, rib, the ribeye will tell you everything you need to know about a beef. It sure will. The ribeye will. And so, uh, you know, that, that is a good thing, uh, too, is that the way that we, when we start using these cameras, the carcass cameras uh, here in the U.S., we actually get the, the exact measurement on those ribeyes on every ribeye uh, using the camera. We get the intermuscular fat. We get all those uh, readings. You need and, one of those cameras, Desi. I know. I keep you telling got lost you. In I, the mail get, somewhere. I think it did. I got to get you a camera. <laughs> I got to get you a camera. <laughs> I just, I just think it'd be pretty neat. I think the last time we talked, you have it rigged up where you can basically hover it over a, a piece of meat or something and basically tell you everything about it in a way, huh? Is yeah. That what, is that what I they mean, do? For your business, even in the shop, you can put it on a, a stationary piece of meat. You know, it doesn't have to be hanging. Um, you can you put your ribeye down and you can, uh, you know, take a capture the image of it and then you'll get all that readout on it, on each yeah. individual piece. The th- and the reason they differentiate, though, is because to get a true value is you need to take the 12th rib you know, if you're grading a carcass, uh, you don't need to wait till later and grade like the fourth rib or, you know, the fifth rib, because that's going to be a higher grade because it's closer to the chuck than the the 12th. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to use it, you know, to kind of weigh on your sire or in dams, you want to make sure you grade that same rib every time. So you have Mm -hmm. apples to apples. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, that Delmonico meat that butts up to that rib is not a bad steak. <laughs> no, it ha- no, it's not. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you, that's something that uh, having a meat shop and, you know, it's been fun to be able to kind of educate a consumer. We, It's not your nor- normal meat market because, yeah, we've got the fillets and the strips and the ribeyes and the sirloins, but also we're going to have the flat iron. We're going to have the hanger oh, steaks. Wow. We're going to have the... I mean, every cut that comes off a carcass, that's the advantage of raising your own beef. But the problem is the consumers, you know, outside of a few cuts, they don't know those other cuts exist. So you got to kind of, you kind of, kind of got to give them to them, let them, let them try them, try something different. And the next thing you know, they're coming in, they're buying the Denver steak over the strip. Uh They're buying the the flat iron instead of a flank, you know, they're, and so, and so you kind of get to utilizing the whole carcass, which, which, we're fortunate now that we're able to do that. There's not one cut that doesn't go unused on our, off our animal from the oxtail to the tongue is what I like mm-hmm. to tell them because that's, we sell it. And um, that's really important because every cut on that beef is good. And, you know, even the roast. Right. I do want to encourage people to try that flat iron. It's it's off the charts and the, the, uh, you know, all of the cuts, all of the different cuts. And you can go online and find a recipe for, I, I just say, be, you know, adventurous and try some different cuts. And there's all kinds of recipes online uh, on how to make those cuts. And they, they're delicious in themselves. Um, but they they are there for a reason because they've been chosen from special areas that are known for tenderness and and beef flavor. It, you know the beef flavor on those flat irons. Yeah, I love well, yeah, it. it's it's a strong it's a strong flavor, but that's supposed to be you know the second or third most tender cut on the animal too. Right, right. So, I mean, I like to tell people in our store, you know, cut it with a spoon. That's kind of our mm-hmm. that's our goal. Yeah, well, I tell you what, I'm I'm gonna, uh, I I'm dying to get to your store. <laughs> can oh, I order I'm online? Can I see it? Stuff. Can I see it online? 
Well, you can. We have a, a website, uh, midlandmeatco.com. And, okay. you, you know, we, we don't take orders online because I don't want to get where somebody buys us out. You know, I know that sounds right. terrible, but Midland is Midland and I want to serve my customer there. But at the end of the day, you can call our store. Um, like I said, we can we can take care of you. And um, that's uh, all that's on that website. And also we're on social media. You know, we get. We're on Facebook, Instagram, things like that at, under just Midland Meat Co. And then, you know, we've got a little restaurant too. This thing's this thing has integrated into. I've got a restaurant. The the I didn't know call, that. Tell us about your restaurant. <laughs> oh no, the it's called the the Half Acre Midland Meat Company's Half Acre. It's a it really started as a food trailer where I was long on cuts. You know, at the first you. You know, I can tell you the first couple of years, you're you're looking at your beef and, and like the ribeyes, all that stuff's easy to sell, but you, you can back up on some things. And, you know, we had shoulder clods or we had chuck rolls, things like that. And and I'm like, well, let's cook it. And so one of my barbecue guys, Aaron Leslie, just said, hey, I'll, I'll pull a trailer behind your shop and we'll, we'll start selling some barbecue. And he's pretty good cook anyway. It's like, it's, it's not like he's going to, well, you know, Next thing we know, we got a line and people waiting for this barbecue and he'd sell out pretty quick. And next thing I know, I'm like, well, I'm going to look for a place because this isn't, we need more space. And now it's the half acres, the name of it. And we were fortunate enough, Texas Monthly named us top 25 new barbecue joints in Texas. And we use our beef in there. You know, I, I, I have to put a disclaimer. We don't use my briskets anymore. Because I only I harvest about 30 head a week on average. And so, you know, that's 60 briskets. And right now our restaurant currently does anywhere from 150 to 200 briskets a week. <laughs> I can I know they do. That's why I wanted the brisket. <laughs> but all of our other cuts are there. You get beef ribs and what. And I'm about to do an expansion. I'm looking at it out my office window here, but um we're about to double our size. I it's uh we've been very blessed. Like I said, it's it's been a good ride. It's been fun. Um, the integration part, you know, obviously now that uh, we purchased a farm, I'm going to get in where I'm, you know, I've got an outlet, a little more security for drought. Um, also, I can pasture my cattle, my wheat pasture stuff and uh, utilize everything I've got to go towards this beef. And so it's, it's, it's been good. Like I said, uh, we've, we've been extremely blessed. The Lord, you know, he, he, he keeps showing away and, and really that's kind of what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel is feeding people. So as long as I'm feeding people, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, you're doing a good job of it. I can tell you that well, I've heard a lot of good stuff. Well, I'm going to have to send you some more stuff. I know it's been a, a couple of years since you probably eaten any of it and you, you probably get your fair share of Wagyu beef. So, you know, you just tell me what you want and I'll send it out there. Well, I, I love brisket. I mean, it's hard to, you know, that's hard to beat. Um, I, and I like sliced brisket. I like the, you know, old school brisket. Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah I, yeah, I can tell you this stuff, will, it, it's different. And, you know, we've we won. We've been so fortunate. It's so fun. It's like fun to me because I'm a competitive guy. You know, I grew up playing sports and different things. And the whole competition world of the of the meat. I never knew existed, honestly, um, till one of those guys comes in the meat store. And I've got so many funny stories. I can sit here all day and tell you stories. But, <laughs> you know, from the very first customer that walked in and looked at our meat case, and I've got a strip there, which is marbled. If you go to our website or our, any of our social media, you can see what our meat looks like. And, and it's, uh, I can't remember, I had it like a 20, $26 a pound, something like that. Um, and he walked in and he said, he said, man, that's, that costs more than a barrel of oil. And he turned around and left and, um, Midland, Midland's an oil town. So everybody, <laughs> everybody in Midland knows the price of oil at every time, every day of the week. And so I looked over at Adrian, my man, and I go, I said, Adrian, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> and, uh, luckily, you know, eight and a half, nine years later, we're still doing it. And it's been, it's been good, but yeah, those, the brisket deal has really been fun. Like this year we won San Antonio again with a first place brisket had, I, I think I, uh, six of the top 10 out there. And that's one of the largest cook-offs in the world. And our ribeye performed really well. We, 
we took seven or eight of the top 10 spots in ribeye and, and, um, uh, those just, that just kind of benchmark, you know, I don't, we don't do that for the trophies. You saw our shop. We probably have 10 or 12 trophies in there. And those are just some of the bigger ones that our cooks let us have. Kind of. Uh-huh. But, uh, it's just more of a benchmark kind of let us know our beef's still doing good. And, you know, I get to pat those 350 pound cooks on the back and tell them they cooked, they cook good. And, and so well, I get to eat good most of the time. Let's just put it that away. Oh, and by the way, oil is up way more than that beef right now. <laughs> well, it, I think uh, without looking, it's probably around $80. I'm That's just right. Guessing. Like I said, everybody in the, around this area knows what oil is and what, what the cost is. But that's that's kind of our driver, you know, that's Midland. Um you know, we're in a we're in a unique place in the in the country here where we generate the majority of the oil here in the in the state of Texas too. I mean, Midland and Martin County are the, the probably the two largest counties producing oil and and um uh, but anyways, it's a it's what it is. You know, I like to go back though because our the way our family got here and we were, we were built on cattle and, and had a bank back then started a bank, but this is always, it always was a cattle town from, from day one when, when it was named Midway for a little bit, because mm-hmm. it was ha- halfway between Fort Worth and El Paso. And like you said, you, anybody that knows anything about Fort Worth, you've heard about the historical stockyards. Well, that's where everything got sold. So cattle in the Western part of the country would have to get to El Paso so they could get on a train and they would ride that train to Fort Worth. Well, Midland's half, nearly exactly halfway between the two places. And they would water cattle. And that's where kind of we started by and opening businesses and doing things here in Midland. And um, it became a hub for business. And then oil obviously hit in the late 20s and early 30s and really, uh, really took this area and, and boomed it. Well, I, I, it's an, it's an interesting place and your story is just amazing. And I'm, I just, I'm just I'm so honored to even know you, John, you've done so no. much and done so well with everything. And it's a, uh, I just so glad I can share you with everybody through this well, podcast. You, 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 Desi, you've been a treat <laughs> since the first time I visited. And I, and honestly, I, I don't, I don't like, and I don't want to take credit for any of this. Like I said, it's, it's, it's the good Lord. God's, God's in control of this thing. It goes back to that bull. I mean, it's, it's, it's what it is. It's a hundred years of genetics and a hundred years of decisions. And it, whether they were right or wrong, those were the decisions that we made. And, and that's where we are here today. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been, a, it's been really, truly great The the people you meet in this industry and know, you know, that's another thing that doesn't get, we're, we're such a minority and, um, so where I mean, you got less than one percent of this country or this world feeding ninety nine percent of it. Exactly. And when, when you narrow that down, and you know the cattle business, what I've learned after now being in the cattle business and in the meat business, the meat business is a little more cutthroat. And I wish it wasn't that way because the cattle business is still a handshake, and you don't need contracts. You know, a man's word is a man's word, and it's still good. The meat business gets a little bit it gets a little bit choppy in there. And I think uh, that's where we lose sight of what's important. And, you know, the farmers and ranchers of this country, they're the backbone of it. And when we keep, when we keep kind of pushing those guys down, we're running out of food and, and we're the people producing it. Right. So um, it's, it's really tough. You know, we got a lot of, we got a lot of challenges. It's uh it's what it is, but uh I think it takes a, a different breed, a, a human to go out there and say, I'm going to go farm or I'm going to go ranch because it takes a little more work than most. 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 And, you know, uh, John, I've heard so many comments from so many of my rancher friends that their kids don't want to take over the ranch like they were hoping they would. And I just hate that we're losing that segment of, you know, generational ranching. That's mm. why yours uh, meant so much to me. Um, right. You well, know, and it, I, can, I can tell you on that because every generation I've heard from my granddad, you know, I never, I didn't get to work with my great granddad, obviously, but my granddad and then even my dad and you're hearing it now is just help is getting harder and harder to find. I mean, I've been hearing that since I was a teenager. And then, you know, today it, you're, we're up against the same things. 
but I can tell you, and that's where, cause I've got three daughters and a son. I grew up, I had four sisters. I have four sisters. Um, it, it, the way we do it with Midland Meat Company now, and now with a restaurant, we, you know, it gives opportunity to somebody that might not want to go be on the ranch and run the cattle, but they want to stay in the family business. Well, now there's a meat market. Right. And then hey, they don't want to do that. Well, there's a restaurant. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things to do. And we haven't changed our cow herd other than tweaking it here and there. But as far as adding number, it's the same cattle doing the same thing. The only difference is now it's supporting by going fully retail like we have from instead of, you know, supporting four or five ranching families, we're supporting now. We've I've, that video was made over the last year and a half, two years. Well, we're we're pushing close to 50, 50 families that we all work with employ. You know that the the ranch employs, and the same cattle are paying for those bills. So it's a way to do it, and it just takes. You know, you just kind of got to go do it, and right, and um. That's just, that's just it. It's, it's, it's just a matter of doing it. Just do it. Yep. I know yep. that's, that's how we survive. Well, John, I have appreciated you being on this podcast and, uh, did you, what, did you want us to say anything else or close with anything else? Have we left anything out? And I don't, I don't know. I mean, you ask me, I, I tend to ramble and talk. So <laughs> if, if I didn't talk about something, you know, ask me, I don't know, um, uh, I mean, you know, I think we covered covered all the bases, and uh, we got a good feel. I I have a even better feel of Midland Meats now, and and that's what I wanted people to know because I knew you had a great company, and I knew you were a self made business and a generational rancher, and those are the things that I think were the most important uh, parts that I wanted to get across uh, yeah. to people that th this does exist here in the U S and uh, this is where ha how meat is made and how, how it goes to the market. And uh, I just wanted people to see it and it does, yeah. you know, people do get up at 5 AM. <laughs> right. And they, you know, they'd be up a little earlier, but that, yeah, that's, that's when we catch horses at 5 AM. Yeah, 5 AM. If you're five oh five, you're probably late. So, uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's you know, and that that's what's fun. The the unspoken rules on a ranch. You know, there's a lot of people, like I said in that video, that won't don't get to experience like that bull story, mm -hmm. but just experience the the sunrises and the sunsets out on a out on a place. You know, when you look around, you don't see anything. You're the only one there, and it's you and God's creation and His animals, and it's just. Uh, there, there's no better feeling to me to be out there with that. And, you know, I, all I want to stress to people of, of all generations of all ages, you know, it's never too late to change what you're doing. Um, you know, that's, that's what, that's what ruins a lot of generational ranches is they do the same thing every year, every year, every year. And sadly our market is set up to diminish that because you know, you, you don't have to go back too far to where you used to could sell calves right off the cow. Mm -hmm. And so to a cow calf guy, that was great. But, um, you know, and then you get a little further a couple of years later, the buyer says, no, you need to vacuum 30 days and, and wean them. And so the cow calf guy, okay, I'll hold them. And then, you know, the next year, no, vac 45, you need to hold them 45 days. And then it's 65 days. And then, so the cow calf guy is constantly getting, but it's never too late to change what you're doing. And, um, you know, it's, and just do what works in your country. Everybody's country is different. You know, we're, we're fortunate where we are in the kind of centrally located in the country, we can run English bred cattle. And then, like I said, bring in the Wagyu's and they do great. So it all depends on where you're at in the United States on what kind of cattle you can run and understand your cow and your grasses and, and do the best you can. That's right. Well, thank you so much, John. I, I appreciate you and uh, thank you for all of the information and sharing your pictures and uh, yeah. videos. And uh, I just, I just really appreciate you. Thank you again. And I want to well, happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, see you all later. And just oh, and you can get in touch with John and order 
uh, some great meat or go to go to Midland, I, I'd make a trip just to go get that kind yeah. of meat. <laughs> Yeah, come on. We'll 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 welcome you in uh, midlandmeatco.com. You can kind of you can kind of read our story. I'll I'll try to update the website before tomorrow. How about that? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. All Bye right, everybody.